All right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and the, the invitation to speak here. So I'm going to talk about factorization homology. Um, and I'll tell you what that is in a variety of contexts. First, let me articulate sort of a, a very, from a, from a bird's eye view, what the essential goal of this subject is. So the essential goal is to study multiplicative invariants. for a moment, multiplicative describes what it does on disjoint unions. So if, if our invariant, for instance, was a numerical invariant, then it would mean that the value on a disjoint union was the product, rather than say the sum of the values on the individual connected components. Or if Z was taking values in, let's say, abelian groups or chain complexes, then what would be naturally assigned to a disjoint union would be the tensor products of the values on the individual factors. So one of the, the great themes in 20th century mathematics is the study of additive invariance by sheaf theory on the space X. So an additive invariant of X should be studied um, by, in terms of the homology or cohomology of sheaves on X itself. So for, for these kinds of additive invariants, say topology, well natural ones are the Euler characteristic or the signature of a four n dimensional oriented manifold or um, or the, the index of the Dirac operator. And the sorts of, you know, in the case of numerical invariants, um, or in the case of uh, in the case of numerical invariants, and then what's the sort of what what's the sort of result that you might hope for in terms of sheaf theory? Well, is to describe this in terms of integration uh, of in, of some natural class in, in sheaf cohomology. So in this case, the description of the Euler characteristic this way would be the generalized Gauss Binet theorem or the Gauss Binet theorem. For the, the description of the signature in this terms would be Hertzsprung signature theorem that it's naturally given by integrating the L class. And the description of the index of the Dirac operator on a spin manifold this way would be given by the Atia Singer index theorem that it's the given by integrating the A hat genus. So, um, so you might want to understand multiplicative invariance in the same way. Where these multiplicative invariants have a number of sources. In topology, uh, they naturally arise, for instance, as partition functions of field theories. So partition functions of field theory will naturally you know, tend to be described more as a product on the, of the individual factor, of the values on the individual factors, rather than, say, the sum, like an Euler characteristic. Right. So the, what's the idea for, um, uh, for, for for describing this in terms of sheet theory. Well, the first thing to observe is that you can't describe a multiplicative invariant really in terms of the sheet theory on the individual space X. So simply for the reason that if Z is given by sheet homology or cohomology, then its values on disjoint unions will be direct sum rather than tensor product. So if you want to use usual sheet theory to, to, to study such an invariant, it has to take place on some other space rather than the space X or X disjoint union Y itself. So what space should that be? So there's an idea of balance and Blinfeld is to use what's known as Ron spaces. Um, so so to, to start things off, I'll tell you what Ron spaces are. I'll give you a, a formula for how you, um, for how this, for how the subject works, because it'll, 
similar ideas will apply in, in differential topology, will apply in <coughs> complex algebraic geometry, will apply in uh, algebraic geometry over a finite field, uh, will apply in Riemannian geometry. Um, and so we'll, we'll trace through some of these ideas in each of those examples. Um, and that'll, just, that'll take the next 30 or so minutes. So but first, let me tell you what these rod spaces are. So, so first, let's say in this case that x is a uh, topological space. Although a similar uh, definition will work for varieties. So then, um, first, we'll define the uh, configuration space. So the configuration space of I points in X is the collection of ordered I tuples, X1 to XI, uh, such that XJ is not equal to XK for J not equal to K. So it's the complement of all diagonals in X ordered configuration space of I tuples in X. So note that there's an action of the symmetric group given by permuting the order, um, and we can take the quotient, and that would be the unordered configuration space. So the definition, the run space of X is as a set the union of these unordered configuration spaces of points in X uh, for I beginning with 1. And this will be the definition of X is connected. Now I've just said what it is as a set. I need to endow this with a topology. And this will be topologized. Uh, with the, I always get this, uh, with the finest topology. Such that each of the maps um, from X to the I where this sends some I tuple such that for any i, this map is continuous. So its finest topology means most open sets. So in other words, uh, a subset of ran of x is open if and only if its inverse in x to the i is open for every i. See what this means. So, the first way you might think to topologize this is just to give, make this the disjoint union of all of these spaces. Let's say x is connected. Now we can see that as a, as a map of sets, this image map sends x to the i to different components in this space. So, if we consider x to the two, mapping to uh, random x. So sitting inside here is the, um, well, it's conf, I'll write this way, conf 1 of x mod sigma 1. And note that the x embedded as the diagonal right here will map to conf 1. Now the complement of the diagonal, conf 2 of x, will map in here to conf 2 of x mod sigma 2. So this is just the union of x on the diagonal and the complement of the diagonal. This is x2 minus minus the image of the diagonal. And so if you topologize this um, as the disjoint union, well, this map couldn't possibly be continuous because this is a connected space. And so it has to map to a connected component of this space by any continuous map. 
So what you're saying is that if you choose some path in this space that say take two points which are distinct and then collide them at a point on the diagonal, well, the image here has to be a path in this space. So in other words, you're taking these disjoint components and smushing them together so that points can collide. And that's what's being implemented by this definition of forcing these maps to be continuous. Uh, no, so we, we took the quotient by all of these symmetric groups. Oh, so it's only the subsets. There is no, um, there's, uh, there's no ordering, and there's no multiplicity. So X to band has order and multiplicity, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's the, all the, it's the, as I said, it's all subsets of X, all finite non empty subsets of X, and to apologize in this way. I said what it was for X connected, um, for X with multiple components, so the definition continued. Then uh, we'll require. Uh, so in this case, <coughs> I say that ran X consists of all subsets with a similar topology, such that um, S contains. Finite, not empty. S contains at least one point in each component of X. So that's just the product of the one spaces of the components? Exactly. space of X disjoint union Y will be all those dis all those subsets of X disjoint union Y that contain at least one point of X and at least one point of Y. Now this seems like maybe a kind of picky union thing to uh, insist on, but now, as Ron just said a moment ago, um, what does that give us? Well, it gives us, gives us the following property. Now note that I gave you some motivation, and then I gave you a definition, and so far I haven't related in any way the motivation to the definition. Well, they're connected in the following way. We can now observe that if x and that for any x and y, if you consider the Rand space of x disjoint y, well, these are. subsets of x and y that contain at least one point in x and at least one point in y. So every such subset can be uniquely expressed um, by choosing a subset of x and choosing a subset of y. So this random spaces has this property that as a map for topological spaces to topological spaces, it sends disjoint unions to products. So it has this exponential property at the, at the level of spaces themselves. So the idea of balance and Drinfeld is to use, in other words, use sheaf theory on random spaces. So rather than putting the exponential property into the sheaves, put the exponential property into the spaces and use usual sheaf theory on these exponential spaces. Okay, so the, this resulting you know, sheaf homology theories we'll call factorization homology, as in the title of my talk. Uh, and now I'll give you the, the general recipe for, for how factorization homology is going to work in, uh, in a variety of examples. So here's the uh, recipe. So there'll be two inputs. 
factorization homology takes two inputs. One I'll call x, and this will be a geometric input of some flavor of geometry, which will be specified in a case-by-case -case basis. And then there'll be an algebraic input. And what sort of algebra this uh, algebraic input um, has uh, will depend on x. And this geometric input will have a, a dimension. That dimension will be important things in one dimension <coughs> work the same as things in other dimensions. Um, and specifically, the algebraic input will depend on x and also on the dimension. So these will be the two inputs. In each of the examples we'll see, given these two inputs, there will then be a construction that gives maybe a sheaf or a co-sheaf or some such object on the round space of X, given these two inputs. A co-sheaf, let me give it a name, we'll call it F sub A. Given these two inputs, we'll construct such a thing. And then I'll use this integral symbol to denote factorization homology. This is the factorization homology of x with coefficients in a. These are words. Um, will be denoted by this symbol. And this will exactly be the appropriately derived global sections of the sheaf or co-sheaf homology um, of the round space of x with coefficients in this object constructed from a. So this is the recipe. And so we'll follow this, uh, this uh, you know, we'll follow the recipe in a number of examples. So to, to what extent can you uh, axiomatize this? Can you say a factorization homology functor is anything that takes these two inputs and creates an FA that has some multiplicativity property for the round space? And, uh, um, yeah, you could say something like that. You probably want some naturality in X right. with respect to uh, open embeddings, uh, and then yes. And then you can just. Yeah. Okay, so I'll uh, keep track of the the examples that we do right here. So the first example I'll denote one. give you to give you an example, I need to give you two inputs. So in example 1R, our geometric input x will be a one manifold. So let's say it's oriented. For simplicity. Um, and then I need to give you an algebraic input. What sort of algebra is, is allowed? A will be an associated algebra. So this is why I claim how it'll work um, with this sort of geometric input. This is the kind of algebra which will allow us to construct a Cauchy on the round space of our oriented one. How 
how will this work? Well, roughly speaking, a co-sheaf, um, so roughly, a co-sheaf on random x consists of the following data, consists of stocks and specialization maps. Between so this will be a, a constructible Cauchy with respect to the natural filtration on the rain space by cardinality. And so we give a constructible Cauchy is, is, this, sort of, is this sort of data. So first I should tell you what the stocks are. So what's a point in the rain space? I mean, a point in the rain space is exactly a finite uh, a subset of x. So the stock Uh, f sub a at some point uh, s, where s is a finite uh, non empty subset of x, will be a tensor with itself s times. Now, I need to say, well, how are these, these, uh, these glued together um, on all of these layers? So this describes what it is. If we look at each layer, which is some unordered configuration space, um, how are they all glued together? Well, so if I choose some path in the random space of x, so it's path gamma, I need to tell you how, um, how and let's say this path, uh, for simplicity, let's say this path uh, begins with just one point in X, and then it's, you know, or begins with two points in X and then brings them together until they collide at a single point. So here's, here's a little picture of a particular part of the RAN space. Here's some point X, Y. Um, here's some point Z. We choose some path. Uh, gamma from x, y to z. So this is uh, so now we need to give ourselves a map from the stock at x, y in uh, to the stock x, z. Well, this is a tensor to itself twice by what I insisted there. And this is a tensor with itself once. So what could this be? Well, this will be the multiple. So this Cauchy will be, roughly speaking, defined by saying that its stocks are given by tensor products of A, and then the gluing data is given by the multiplicative structure of A. And you might object. You might say, well, how did we know A was only associative? How did we know which order in which to multiply? And the order in which you multiply is given by the choice of orientation on A, on X. Okay, so that's, um, that's, we followed the recipe up to here, and now we should, let's see what this gives us. What's the, uh, uh, what's the reward? This factorization homology thing. Well, in this case, there are not that many uh, one manifolds. So there's the boring value and the not boring value. The boring value is R. In which case, we just get A back up to quasi-isomorphism. The more interesting value is the circle, in which case we get a chain complex, which is quasi-isomorphic to the uh, Hochschild chain complex. Hoc 
function of the object. So this right here is the, uh, is the payoff. So I, I said we we're going to follow this recipe, um, but I guess I didn't tell you too much about what it is that you win once you, once you get an object on the RAND space. So just, uh, I, may not, I may not say too much about it in this lecture, but just maybe for something to, to bear in mind. Um, uh, so something to bear in mind. Uh, there, are, there are three things that you get uh, when you express something in terms of the RAND space. So the uh, payoff. So the first thing is that uh, is that there's well it's just once you say that something is expressed in terms of a sheaf on the RAND space, well sheaves have Meyer Viatoris sequences. You can make local to global arguments on the RAND space. You can say the two things uh, if, both, if two things are both expressed in terms of sheaf homology and you want to say they're the same, well then you can check it on stocks. If they're the same, if they're the same on every stock, for instance. So you get descent and Meyer Viatoris sequences um, on the RAND space. You're making local to global arguments. So, two, the RAND space has a natural cardinality filtration. So there's a filtration where you say that the ith piece consists of the closed subspace with it uh, consisting of those subsets of x with it most i elements. So that gives you a filtration, an ascending filtration. And so that uh, filtrations give you spectral sequences. So you can, uh, you can analyze something computationally by analyzing uh, the layers, which are configuration spaces, and so you know, calculate something by a spectral sequence which takes as input homologies of configuration spaces with, with some inputs, and then converge into something interesting. So lastly, there, there exists a duality. Whenever you say that something is expressed in terms of a a sheaf or co-sheaf on the RAND space, there's a duality on the RAND space. Uh, which is not obvious because the RAND space is something infinite dimensional. But uh, this duality, so this duality is um, a simultaneous generation of, a uh, generalization of Poincaré duality for, for manifolds in the finite dimensional case and Kazool duality in algebra. So this gives you some new source of potential you know, uh, identities, functional equations, things like that, uh, as soon as you are able to express something in terms of the Ron space. So this, I should say, is, uh, is joined with David Ayala. wrote a paper on that subject, and I should say that everything that I say which is due to me today is also uh, joined with David Ayala and some of, uh, I guess I should have said that earlier. It's okay because there's no way that David will watch this. Okay. So um, this was, uh, and some features that will, so this is a payoff, and some features that, that, that we'll get is the, sort of a relation of these things to trace invariants. And we see that right here, because Hochschild homology um, is sort of the, the recipient of a sort of universal trace map for, um, uh, for, for A modules, for perfect A modules. There's a map from the K theory of A to Hochschild homology, and one of the best things about Hochschild homology is that it sort of stands in for some uh, uh, some approximation to K theory, which is best for studying things in terms of traces. Okay, so 
Um, so this is how it works in dimension one, in real dimension one. Any questions about this example before I move on to the next example? So there's a similar, so here, maybe I'll, I'll add, we had two inputs. Uh, the algebraic input was an associative algebra. And the thing that we got out really was hot shield homology. So there's a, we can also consider the case of dimension one uh, for, for curve, complex curves, so Riemann surfaces. In this case, the, this was the original example that Bellinson and Drinfeld study in their book called Chiral Algebras, and the input is a chiral algebra. And the output um, is some sort of derived conformal box. So some derived enhancement of the, of the conformal blocks, the chiral sector of a CFT. Maybe that's all I'll say about that. So there's another, we can also consider these ideas in dimension one over a finite field. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I won't say too much about this, but one of the main results uh, is this can be used to calculate uh, the, the homology of G bundles on a curve. And this is uh, done by uh, Gates, Gorey, and Lurie in their um, proof of Bayes conjecture on Tamagawa numbers over function fields using ideas of balance. So maybe now I'll say more about the uh, dimension n in the real case. So here, x is now an n-manifold. Uh, and a is what's known as an n algebra, which is uh, a slightly more general version or a sort of slightly more structure than what's something known as an EN algebra. And if we wanted the EN algebra version, then X should be framed in a similar way that if we wanted for, to put in associative algebras on the, the round space of a, of a circle, then the circle actually needed to have an orientation, which is equivalent to a framing in dimension one. So recall that a framing is a choice of isomorphism between the tangent bundle and a rank and trivial model over X. There was, in the setup, there was no, no need to require the input to be a manifold. You only need this for the Poincare duality, or, or is uh, it just so that you can do calculations? So, there are versions of this where A is not a manifold. However, what the sorts of algebraic input that are then needed to be oh. placed on A will be, will be um, you will need, so this will describe how you uh, put stuff on the RAND space for those points that miss the singularities. But you also need to give some extra algebraic structure for what is allowed to happen in singularities. And so then, that won't be encoded by an n-disk algebra. It'll be something a little more complicated. And this has uh, been studied uh, in this paper that I wrote with David Isle and Hiro Lee Tanaka called Factorization Homology of Stratified Spaces. So 
So there are some generalizations of the example that I'm about to give. Okay. Well, for example, for graphs, what's going to happen? What's going to be the answer? Uh, for graphs, roughly speaking, we'll see algebras and modules. Algebras on the one-dimensional part and modules on the zero-dimensional parts. And so instead of seeing hot shield homology, then you'll see like two-sided bar constructions. Mm -hmm. So to this picture, here's some module, call it B. Here's some algebra. Uh, or let's say we even allowed our, our singularities to have colors. The key thing is if V and this is W, then the factorization homology of this picture um, is this derived tensor product for V and W over A. So that's the, now you know everything about graphs from how they fit into this picture. Okay, so in this case, um, in the disk algebra, what is it? It's a, it's a functor from a category that I'll write disk n, uh, which has objects which are finite disjoint means of Euclidean spaces. So I'll say in, in chain complexes. Which are finite disjoint means of Euclidean spaces, and where the morphisms from uh, a finite disjoint union of index by i to a finite index disjoint union index by j is chains on the space of the nettings from one of the manifolds to the other. So this defines a category where composition is defined by composition of embeddings, open embeddings, uh, which are smooth. Uh, and an n-disk algebra is a functor from this to chain complexes, which is compatible with the DG structure on the, on the two sides. So it's a DG functor. I'll call this again A, and it has the property, well, I'll just write a for the value on a single Rn. I will use notation. Some people call that abusive notation. It's abusive notation. Um, and so then, with that identification, this I require that uh, the value of A in a finite disjoint union is the, is the value on a single Rn tensor with itself. If, it, if this, the first time that someone sees this definition, it looks weird because I call this an algebra, and for an algebra, there's an underlying object, and it seems like there are lots of objects here, namely the values on all of these uh, i's, so it doesn't seem like an algebra. Uh, so if that's your reaction to this definition, then you can just check the following, which might make you feel better. So if, we had, if I can see the category of finite sets uh, and all maps between them, then um, a commutative algebra is exactly the same thing as a functor. I'll also call it A from finite sets, commutative DGA, from finite sets to chain complexes, such that A of I is A a one element set tends to give itself i times. What's the commutative multiplication? Well, in here, I can just consider the map from the two element set, right that way, to the one element set. And this gives a map from a tensor 2 to a. And this, the symmetric group acts on this. And that says that the symmetric group acts on this. And that, so it has to be commutative. So a commutative algebra is exactly the same thing as a functor from finite sets that sends the set i to the value on a single element set tensor with itself i times. So that's the sense in which this is an algebra. It's determined by its value on a single, um, on a single object together with extra structure, 
namely, you're allowed to multiply things uh, whenever you have a choice of a bunch of embeddings of Rn into a single Rn. That gives you a choice of multiplication. And then the, this, has, this space has higher homology, and this gives you some parameterized sorts of multiplications as you are allowed to move a bunch of Rn's around inside of a bigger embedding space. So that's what an end disk algebra is. Any questions about that definition? So with some sources, and that is algebra. So one is commutative. Given any commutative algebra, it has an associated end disk algebra structure. Another is um, they come from tenfold loop spaces. There's also things known as enveloping algebras and lead algebras, but with an N in front. Uh, they can also be obtained by Are able to quantize an n plus an n shifted Poisson algebra. The natural thing to quantize it to is one of these en algebra things. Um, or closely related to that, uh, if you have a topological field theory, you can whatever that structure is. There should be associated to it the collection of local observables, and the observables on Euclidean space, and these observables on Euclidean space uh, should have the structure of an EN algebra. So these are some sources of this kind of n s algebra structure. So in each, each of these cases, we should be able to put it into this machine here, construct a Cauchy on the round space of our n manifold. And output some sort of homology that's hopefully something interesting. So, um, I will give you quickly. I'll give you two of these. I'll give you tell you what the answer is in sort of in two cases. So how do you get one from an n-fold loop space? Let's say that B is a pointed, pointed space. So then there's um, an n-disk algebra structure on the underlying chain complex of the n-fold loop space of B, where uh, the n-fold loop space of B, recall, is the space of maps of, of a sphere with a distinguished point to B that sends the distinguished point on the sphere, say the North Pole, to the distinguished point of B. So I'll note that as pointed maps and endowed with the compact open topology. So that's a space. We can take chains on it. That has the structure of an end disk algebra. And we can ask, what is the factorization homology? of x with coefficients in this NDS algebra. So a theorem known as non abelian poincare duality uh, which is due to frame Siegel separately to Paolo Salvatore and separately Jacob Lurie. Uh, calculates this in the case where B is assumed to be sufficiently connected. So B is unconnected, which means that the first n minus 1 homology groups are 0, and also the fundamental group is 0. So then, in this case, this complicated thing 
is equivalent to something that is not so hard to describe. It's just chains on the space of maps from S to B. To say it this way, let me also assume that X is compact without boundary. So this hard thing to define is equivalent to this thing, which is much easier to define. And so you might wonder why it's a good thing to construct something that gives you something else that you already know. And it's the reason, uh, it's these sort of three reasons that I gave over, over here. Namely, this thing naturally has a filtration and uh, is naturally has this duality. Um, and you can make descent arguments on the round space. And none of those things are true on this right hand side. So these descent arguments on the Riemann space are the subject of what's known as, in this particular case, are the subject of what's known as good really vice manifold calculus, um, or likewise for the filtration. And this duality, well, it says that it's equivalent to a different factorization homology, which is given by chains on B without the n-fold loops, and that's often something similar. So the, the best computations of this right-hand side uh, actually come via this equivalence. Okay, so here we have this interesting result, uh, assuming that U is n connected. Let me give you, say something slightly about this last case of observables. So, in this case, so given observables in a sort of topological field theory, you can construct from that um, uh, uh, one of these n-disk algebras. Depending what kind of theory it is. Uh, coming from the fact that observations can be extended by zero. Namely, if you have an embedding of two copies of Rn into a third copy of Rn, and you have some observation which is localized um, on these smaller subspaces, well, you can consider it to be an observation on this larger space simply by saying, don't observe anything that's not in the image of these two smaller Euclidean spaces. So that gives you a map from, uh, it said, that says that observables are covariant functor with respect to open embeddings. And then some form of locality should say that the value of an observable is on a disjoint union is given by a tensor product, or maybe a completed tensor product, depending on your situation, of the values on the individual components. So this, this multiplication map for every choice of embeddings is exactly the sort of structure you need to say that something is an n-disk algebra. So this can be, this can be formed. Uh, for more details on this, I, I recommend looking at this book by Costello and William, where they uh, construct a lot of examples along these lines by something similar to this deformation theory. Um, you know, this is where you see the Feynman diagrams. So look at their book for that. They have a, a so what is this thing? Well, there's a map, since you can piece observables that are localized on subspaces together, um, there's a map from this to the global observables on all of x. And you might ask, is this an equivalence? And it's not always an equivalence. It's just a map. But you sh it sort of, roughly speaking, it uh, should be an equivalence. in the case of perturbative uh, TFT. However, there are interesting field theories where you just don't get to say that the, all of the observables are given by piecing together these sort of local observables, uh, and that's just how it is. But this is a really useful tool for studying these perturbative TFTs, as, as you'll see if you look at Costello and Williams' book. Okay, so we've seen some of these examples. We've got these interesting answers out. And you might ask, well, is this the sort of, is this the end of the story? 
Uh, you know, we got to understand some interesting numerical invariants like you know Euler characteristics of one G in this case, in the case of Bayes conjecture on top of Galois numbers, or partition functions and perturbative TFTs using the, this story. You could ask, is that is that the end of the story? So uh, now let's let's note again that there were some limitations in each of these cases. So the limitation here was that B was n connective. The limitation here was that we were looking at a perturbative theory. Um, I won't really say that there was a limitation in the one-dimensional cases. The one-dimensional cases were, were pretty good. Uh, so you can ask, is there, um, is there sort of something beyond these kinds of uh, limitations? So in the case of perturbative TFTs, there is a, a purely mathematical formulation for things that are not supposed to be captured this way, which is known as the cobordism hypothesis of bias and all. A general functor out of a cobordism category is not, you know, needn't be sort of perturbative in this sense. It need not be expressed in terms of the factorizationology of EN algebras. Likewise, you know, you could think of this as this is some kind of a sort of silly, simple, classical sigma model. And if you're looking at a sigma model where the target space doesn't have this really strong connectivity condition that says that B in some sense is not that interesting of space, the larger the dimension of X is, well you can ask, you know, is there some way, some local to global principle coming from X that allows you to understand more general sigma models like that. So to do this, um, the, the sort of program of uh, David uh, that I've worked on with David is to go all the way back to the beginning because these limitations go all the way back to our choice of the round space. So the idea for how to enjoy some of the same successes for this factorization homology, I'll call this the alpha version of factorization homology. So for the beta, the beta version of factorization homology the essential idea is to replace the round space of x with what you might call m sub x, sort of a moduli space of stratifications of x. So, why, why were we looking at just point subsets in X? So very, what is a stratification? A stratification in particular is some filtration of X where the layers are all manifolds of varying dimensions. So the, this consists of X0 sitting inside X1, sitting inside X2, where Xi minus Xi minus 1 is an I-dimensional manifold. So a particular example of a stratification of X is just a bunch of points in X. Now if you think of it that way, you might ask, well, why did we insist that our stratification of X was just points. You know, if these points are arising as some kind of support conditions, you wouldn't expect that a general phenomena on X, you should be able to understand in terms of things whose support is just a bunch of points or localized here <coughs> a bunch of points. Clearly, the support should be something pretty general. So that's the essential idea here. This M sub X is this more general. <laughs> So there's a problem, namely that to define a moduli space of stratifications, well, that could be a pretty gnarly object. It could be, you know, is it a Hausdorff space? Like, it's clearly going to be something which is very infinite dimensional, and it's, uh, it's not clear what sort of, it's not clear how you make sure that it's something well made. So I'll just tell you briefly what this sort of thing is, what the essential idea is to, to, uh, to enforcing some good behavior, just in the example of differential topology. So we've worked this out just in, the, in these sorts of examples, although I think that these ideas will apply more generally. So we say what this is in terms of its functor points. Namely, think of it as a topological space 
But to say what it is is the same thing as to say what a K point of it classifies for some other space. Mm -hmm. So a point. M sub x. In other words, think of this as a map from the point to m sub x. This is equivalent to a stratification. But now the really interesting thing is to say uh, what a path in this moduli space is. Namely, how is one stratification allowed to be deformed into some other stratification as you move through a, a one parameter family? So think of the one simplex as classifying some one parameter family where the special fiber is what's happening at zero and everything else is a generic fiber. So in other words, how are you allowed to deform it at this one point? So this will be classified by, this will classify some E, which is another stratified space with some smoothness conditions where E as a topological space is just delta 1 times x. But it carries some interesting stratification. It's such that as a stratified space, the restriction away from 0 is exactly the fiber over 1 times delta 1 minus 0. So it's a picture. <coughs> So in the case where um, x is, just looks like the line, here's a, a picture of a D. So note that the fiber over every point is just a line, which carries some interesting stratification. In this case, the stratification is just two points. Here is one point. But then the stratification is allowed to be deformed from two points to one point where they collide um, as you approach the special fiber. So this allows you, this idea allows you to make sense of this moduli space of stratifications. For details, you can see a paper, um, uh, our paper with Nick Rosenblum called a stratified homotopy hypothesis. Now you can ask, well, what's the punchline? Remember here, this recipe had to take M2 inputs. Again, X was geometric, and there was some algebraic input well, what sort of algebraic input allows you to construct a, um, a, a co-sheaf on this moduli space, m sub x? Well, the construction, a, this algebraic input in this case, for this a framed n-manifold, then this algebraic input here can be an infinity n category. And so the main theorem of our second paper, of our other paper called factorization homology one, is that from an infinity n category, you can construct a suitable object on this moduli space of stratifications and define this beta version of factorization homology in a similar way. Okay, the, the infinity n category has no stability in it? That's correct. So, um, so a result that, that given the, sort of the history of TFT where stability and adjoints and dualizability conditions are so essential, maybe one of the surprises in, in this work is that this can be done for any infinity n category at all. No, nothing like stability required here. So one of the uh, applications which we're, which we're working on is that this can be used to prove the Kubordism hypothesis, which roughly speaking, can be phrased uh, in the following way. It says that any extended field theory in the sense of a functor from a cobordism category satisfies descent on the moduli space of stratifications. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention and for having me. These moduli of stratifications, uh, does it specialize the RAN space if you put some conditions on the stratifications? Uh, so the, so the RAN space, there's a, there's a map from the RAN space to the moduli space of stratifications. So think of it as a subspace, which is more or less the same thing if x is one dimensional. 
Um, yeah, other than that, that it's, this is just a much bigger object. Don't you also have a projection from MX to run X that just forgets all the positive dimensional strata? Yes, there's, there's also something like that. Could you just say where the stratification is? Is it just a collection of the manifold? Uh, so the, there's a technical definition, which there's some, there's some niceness conditions that I won't get into, but you sh as far as intuitively just how to think of it, it's a sequence. where xi minus xi minus 1 is an i manifold. And then there are some niceness conditions. It's actually a smooth i manifold, and they fit together in kind of a way where everything has a regular neighborhood and things like that. But it's the essential way to think of it. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure exactly how relevant this is, but a big part of the Costello project is the stuff that appeared in the previous book, which is basically renormalization, flows on space theories, and it's a mess. Do you guys have a clear more conceptual way to do that? No. Okay. <coughs> no, uh, so I I don't I don't have any ideas about how to improve on what uh, Costello and Costello William do um, in in the perturbative case, the really interesting thing to me is how to do that sort of thing non-perturbatively. So where there are things should produce, roughly speaking, things on the round space, uh, you'd like to do that sort of a story non-perturbatively to have things, roughly speaking, on this modular space of stratifications. So that's, to me, what, what the really appealing next step would be. Do you have a guess or a, a, a uh, desire for a duality statement in this context? Absolutely. Uh -huh. We are uh, very excited about the duality statement that, that we're going to do. You know. <laughs> but so, so you have a procedure in mind that would take the algebraic input somehow concoct a dual object and will prove a... Yeah. Uh -huh. so, the, um, so there's a dual... So the duality statement just in the case of the RAND space says that Roughly speaking, uh, this is linearly dual to this object. There's some conditions. Uh, there's a more general statement where this is some sort of a formal moduli space. But this, where this is the um, so this is. This isn't always true, but if A is sufficiently connected, then it's true. Um, and, and just reflects that A was an end disk algebra. So it's the Oh, it's the this is just for the main space. space. Okay. Yeah. So there's a, this is just a, on the rain space, and so we expect to offer So this is just the Cousin dual of the end disk algebra. That's right. Thank you, John, again.